thought. Eh? I call this for me is the finest television ever filmed. Nothing will better it. It had all the ingredients. Sex, violence, rock and roll, and fun. I'm... I mean, it's Claudius. Oh, sister, a manicus. Oh, that Claudius. They told me you're a half-wit. It's about people, it's about power, and it's about uh, what happens when power is completely seated in one place. Down on your knees, all of you! Bend your heads! I shall sever each one at the neck! A rattling good story, bloody well told. In September 1976, BBC Two viewers were taken back over 2,000 years for a roller coaster ride through ancient Rome and the lives and deaths of Emperors Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, and Claudius, the hero of Robert Graves' novels. Shown in 13 parts, this was an everyday story of not quite ordinary folk murdering, plotting against, and having sex with each other all of the time. Epic ingredients for a surefire hit. Responsible for bringing an X-rated up Pompeii to the screen was Martin Lismore, rising BBC star and producer of quality adaptations like How Green Was My Valley, North and South and The Palaces. He put together Claudius. He was responsible for that, putting that together. He's the hero of the whole thing. I, Claudius, was an ambitious undertaking, so Lismore turned to Herbert Wise, an experienced TV director who he'd worked with before on Man of Straw in 1972. Martin came out of his office and came up to me and says, Oh, he said, Herbie, um, just tell me something. I, Claudius, do you know it? I said, yes, very much so. I mean, he said, do you like it? I said, wonderful, yes. He says, do you want to do it? I said, what? He said, if you want it, it's yours. And I couldn't believe this. It was just absolutely wonderful. Herbert Wise's track record was second to none, ranging from Z Cars to Elizabeth R, The Lovers to Upstairs Downstairs. To pack the squad with more experience, the BBC approached Jack Pullman to adapt the novels. Pullman was a veteran of Poldark, War and Peace and the spy thriller The Executioner. He was very good at the full-blooded, he was very good at the ironic. Above all, he was terribly good at humour. And they'd need a sense of humour to help them overcome their first problem, the curse of Claudius. Legend had it that Emperor Claudius himself had put a hex on any attempt to dramatise his story. All these attempts had been made to shoot this project, which is such an obvious thing to want to put on the screen, and everybody had failed. <laughs> the most famous failure was Alexander Corder's ill-fated production starring Charles Lawton in 1937, which was abandoned after a series of disasters. There'd been broken legs and God knows what, and death, and so forth. So there was a curse that could never be done. Is there... Anyone else who wishes to call attention to my misfortunes? That's the broadest East End Cockney I've ever heard in my life. It seemed the BBC's attempt would be equally doomed. Corder's company, London Films, still owned the rights to I, Claudius. An American producer claimed that he had a right over the thing and that he was not prepared to release it to the BBC, and Martin said to me, it's off. The long drawn out legal arguments came as a relief to Jack Pullman, who was struggling to find the key to his imperial family. He heard a speech of Prince Philip, who talked about the royal family, who the workers, who lived over the shop, you know, in Buckingham Palace. And that kind of set him thinking. I wasn't going back to Rome, I was thinking of taking the children down to the house in Austria. It's really a soap opera. Jake did say at one point that what he'd written about was a Jewish family. The only difference was they happened to rule the world. Are you leaving, Mrs? Yes, Mother. If we leave now, we'll be in Rome before nightfall. However good they were, Jack's scripts looked destined to gather dust like ancient relics in the BBC's drama department. And then about a year later, Martin rang me up. He said, you won't believe it, it's on again. And that was the most wonderful moment of my life, and this is not an exaggeration. After so many problems before an actor had even put on a skirt, worried executives actually consulted Claudius's earthly representative, the original author, Robert Graves. I heard that the BBC had actually asked uh, Graves uh, whether it would be all right if they went ahead with this. And Graves is reputed to have replied yes, um, because he had a hotline through to Claudius. And uh, yes, because I've always been very good to Claudius and he's always been very good to me 
um, and he knows I need the money. With both the dead emperor and the novelist on board, Lismore and Wise set about casting the crucial part of Claudius. But who could they find to play a teenager and an old man almost simultaneously? London Films, who'd retained a degree of editorial control, thought they had the answer. They talked about Charlton Heston at one point, they talked about Ronnie Barker, um, but they'd always talked about two Claudii, a young one and an old one. Martin and Herbert had a different idea. Derek Jacobi had already demonstrated how he could age successfully in their production, Man of Straw. Oh, it's very regrettable. I mean, who's going to take it on now? You've made her second-hand good, so to speak. Before that, Jacobi was a classical stage actor who'd made his name working for Laurence Olivier at the National Theatre. With Shakespeare still uppermost in his mind, he almost missed out on the part of a lifetime. I got a call from my agent, and they said, and my agent said, um, they're thinking of you for Claudius. I thought they were talking about Hamlet. And I said, well, no, I want to play Hamlet. I'm, I'm not old enough for Claudius yet. I want, I'm, Hamlet's my part. No, you silly fool. I, Claudius. And that's the first I heard of it. But it was a terrible mistake. I was all ready to turn it down. I, Tiberius, Claudius, Drusus, Nero, Germanicus, uh, this, that and the other. Because I, Claudius starts with the ageing emperor writing his memoirs, it was clear that both makeup artist and leading man were in for something of an endurance test. I had to get in at about five, six o'clock in the morning to be ready for 11 o'clock. That was tedious. It was tedious for me and it was hard work on Pam Meager who, who did my makeup. I had to start off with soap in Derek's hair bag. Then I put a plastic cap on him. I had latex around his eyes to there, put eye bags on, then a huge piece here, then his neck. By 10 o'clock at night, my uh, beard had started to grow through it, so it was hell to get off. I was in such a panic at the first episode to get it off him. He, I said, get in the bath, get in the bath, in the dressing room. And in I would get with a snorkel. And I would lie under the water with the snorkel and gradually gradually Claudius would come off. And I've got one at home, a whole, a whole face came off once. Born the Emperor Augustus's nephew with a string of disabilities, the young Claudius would never have been considered a future leader of the Roman Empire. He was the runt of the litter, you know, he was the man with the limp and the lisp and so nobody thought anything of him. Good night, Grandmother. That's my foot you're treading on. <laughs> Sorry. So therefore, he could be present where they would discuss affairs of state or very in intriguing things, and then say, well, don't take a notice of him, he's stupid anyway. He twitches, he stutters, and he limps. He's an embarrassment to everyone. Even his mother can't stand him. You have to remember the story was pre-Christ. No one ever said, you know, love the poor and afflicted, which is why she couldn't take poor little Claudius to her heart. Oh, Claudius, you are such a fool. I've no patience with you. It should have been you who died, not Germanicus. What use are you to anyone? She was desperately ashamed of him, I think, as a, you know, as a young man. She couldn't be proud of him. There was nothing to be proud of. You were the biggest fool any mother was ever punished with. Who cares about your stupid history? Nobody is going to read it anyway, and certainly not Tiberius. The only way you would get him to read it is if you drew naked women all over it. Then he'd only look at the pictures. She was the old Rome, not the flashy lot falling over each other to sort of, you know, get into position. I mean, she was the daughter of Mark Antony. All you are, you owe to Rome. But you've destroyed it, all of you, with your greedy ambition and your petty selfishness. Well, then, enjoy what you have made of it, but don't come crying to me. She was one of the few moral people in the piece, you know, who stood up for what she thought was right. I'm going to kill myself. Now, don't start any nonsense. But you can't. Oh, yes, I can. My life's my own. It'll be a welcome release. I've no wish to go on living in this place. I've stayed too long, and I've always thought it the height of good manners to know when to leave. And Claudius... Claudius... Please... Don't make a muddle of the valedictory. And the marvellous thing about Claudius, there was the vulnerability, but also you could see the steel inside. You thought, no, they're not going to get you down. 
You're going to win in the end. I was wrong about you. You see, we judge too much on appearances. And, well, I, I mean, your appearance is against you. I mean, you know that, don't you? I mean, you give everybody the impression that you're a bit of a fool. No point in mincing matters. But you're not such a fool, are you? Well, when I first was approached for the part of Augustus Caesar, I think that I just turned it down. I thought I was miscast. I thought I'd be very good as Tiberius. Brian Blessed first worked with Herbert Wise in the 1960s, becoming a big noise on the small screen when playing PC Fancy Smith in Z Cars. More understatement followed as Porthos in The Three Musketeers. Blessed had his doubts about playing Emperor Augustus and thought Herbert Wise should look elsewhere. Surely this should be, uh, you know, Alec Guinness, or this should be Paul Schofield. He said, no, 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 I want you to play it. Incidentally, I hope you don't think I'm going to pay for these games. I've had a very expensive year. Well, if you feel like that about the games, we didn't have them at all. I don't feel like that about the games. I just feel like that about paying for them. Well, nobody's asking you to pay for them. Yes, well, as long as that's understood. Well, Brian actually surprised me because I hadn't, to be honest, seen Augustus quite in the way that he played it. But I loved what he did. He brought this bluster and the, the, the bombacity to him, which was actually a surprise to me, but I loved it. One of my favourite scenes. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. It's all the senators lined up in a row and they've all slept with my daughter. Is there anyone in who has not slept with my daughter? Take them out! I'll decide what to do with them later! And then you see the power of Caesar. Get them out, get them out, get them out, get them out. I'll deal with them later. I mean, they're gonna die slowly. Behind this great man was a great woman, his wife, Livia, whose specialist subjects included cruelty, murder and deceit. You never said anything to me. Have you so little to occupy your time that I must keep you informed of the comings and goings of everyone in the household? You're always complaining you have too much to think about and not enough time to think about it in. Perhaps you'd care to see the laundry lists in future. Sean Phillips was a star of the West End of London as well as Cardiff and returned to her roots in Martin Lismore's production of How Green Was My Valley. It was during the making of the series that Martin approached her to play Livia, the real power behind Augustus's throne. Although he was the Emperor, she was never, ever satisfied with him because uh, she knew his character and it just wasn't quite up to the job and he wasn't smart enough, he didn't work hard enough, so she was going to give him a bad time. Why are you so bad-tempered? It's you that bad-tempered. Your temper gets worse by the day. Everybody notices it. I think you could do with a rest. A long one. She was a dreadful woman, there's no getting round it. But she did it all for her family. She was ambitious for them and she wanted... She wanted the family to do well and to stay in power. So she did everything and anything that she could to expedite that. Augustus was Livia's second husband, and what drove her on was the determination that her son, Tiberius, would succeed Augustus as emperor. She'd already murdered several close relatives to make that happen, and now only Augustus himself stood in her way. Aware that he was in danger from his wife, Augustus would only eat fruit he had picked himself. Not to be outdone, Livia applied poison to his figs as they hung on the tree. After that, all she had to do was wait. It was very strange because as he died, all the electricity went off in the studio. We all stood there and he was dead. And then it all came back again. And nobody could figure out why, so that was kind of spooky. The eerie goings-on were the least of their troubles, particularly in the early episodes, as Wise and the cast had a difficult time hitting the right note. So you've got Shine, you've got Derek, you've got George Bake, you've got all these different people. Uh, uh, and um, we were dreadful. We, we just couldn't make it natural. It was awful. Well, it's been really hard, but I thought, this isn't coming out right. Now you may kiss me and take I remember saying to her, what on earth are you trying to do with this part? Because she was so earnestly searching for something. She said, well, I'm trying to justify the evilness of this character. I said, you can't justify it. 
You just are evil. You are Cruella de Vil, and you must relish the evil. Sean Phillips may have found her role model, but Jack Pullman was still searching for his. What he needed was a 1970s parallel to bring his imperial family to life. Jack had enormous struggle with writing because he couldn't find the tone. And when he did, the key for him, totally, was the Mafia. They were the Mafia. <gasps> mafia, Italy, Rome. Suddenly one started holding people. How nice to see you. You are looking lovely. I've always admired you. And then when that person's gone out of the room, I'm going to slit her throat one day. I hate her. <laughs> Goodbye, old friend. Goodbye. Jack's great genius was to bring all those situations and all those characters to life in a, in a way that they sounded contemporary. It read very well, but it played even better. That's uh, that was the secret of Jack's writing, I think, was that it was, I mean, he was a genuine dramatist. And uh, the minute it got off the page, the minute the book was down, it played magically. What is the matter with him? The matter with him? Why does he keep clearing his throat like that? Well, he's had a very bad cough. Well, can't he get rid of it? It's very irritating to live with someone who's clearing his throat all the time. Well, he's taking a cough mixture. Oh, I see. The colloquial tone of Jack's writing offended some critics. It was quite a departure from the usual classic zero. I've arranged a suite of rooms for you in the palace. <coughs> you can come and live with me and my sisters. Like that. <coughs> The whole family will be together. I'm very fond of my family. Generally speaking. And gradually, it was word of mouth, it was public who, who decided they liked it. It seemed to be something the public in general took to, because I used to go shopping down a market in Queen's Crescent, where we lived at the time, in Belsize Park, and I'd get the stall holders saying, you come to get your poison mushrooms here, you know. I was off with my dog, and the dustman was there, collecting a wonderful program, George. <laughs> and I thought, my God, we, we are getting quite a big audience, a huge audience. This is not just uh, the intelligentsia. No, everybody loved it. I think I'm loved by a great many people. Oh, you're loved all right, but you're not well loved. And you are, I suppose. Well, as to that, I couldn't say, but unlike you, I don't worry about it. Before being cast as Livia's son, Tiberius, George Baker was a veteran of both stage and screen. He made his film debut in The Dam Busters in 1954, and before I, Claudius, he played opposite Sean Phillips in the musical version of Goodbye, Mr. Chips. However, Tiberius and his mother weren't exactly singing in perfect harmony. Will you stay out of my affairs? Your affairs? You wouldn't be emperor if it weren't for me. Well, what's done can be undone. Tiberius didn't want to be emperor. I think that's a source of one of his greatest unhappinesses, was that he was pushed into a position in which he didn't want to be. And that was fun to play. I am not Augustus. No, you're not. Otherwise, this situation would never have arisen. Well, it's the tragedy of, of a weak man with a strong mother. <laughs> you know, she was ruling him, and he couldn't escape her. And he tried, you know, he couldn't. And he was, his life was one continuous frustration. I must have been nodding when I gave birth to you. I sometimes wonder, Mother, whether you ever did anything so natural as giving birth. And he waddles around like a small boy after her. Yes, Mummy, no, Mummy. <laughs> it's terrible, really. It's an awful relationship. You know, the men were kind of slightly dim. You know, they were very aggressive and, and they were doing their best, but they just weren't quite smart enough, were they? <laughs> I just loved that kind of slightly mulish quality he brought to it. Ellie, is that... No one among them you can trust? No man of integrity? Not that I know of. Isn't that a terrible comment on our times, Uncle? As Tiberius aged, his great-nephew Caligula was plotting the succession. If you can't find a man of integrity, I always say, look for a man with ambition. He was only too happy to get rid of him so that he could become emperor himself. Before he died, he took from his finger this ring 
his own seal and placed it on my finger. And he said, I die in peace, little Gaius, knowing that you rule in my place. The only thing is that he didn't quite finish the job first time round. Long live Rome! Master! He's alive again! The Emperor's alive again! He's calling for his supper and he wants his ring back! Rather than give the ring back, Caligula simply finished Tiberius off properly and his infamous reign began. He was past redemption in terms of sanity. I want you to go out and collect all the important statues of the gods in Rome and replace their heads with one of my own. Your own? Yes. Since first working with Herbert Wise in Menace in 1961, John Hurt had played Master Rich in the film A Man for All Seasons, but it was as Quentin Crisp in The Naked Civil Servant that he really flaunted his talents. Hey, mister. Me and my mates, we've been watching you. You're a puff, ain't ya? You cannot touch me now. I am one of the stately homos of England. He was a known quantity to me, and I knew that he would be wonderful in the part. Why he was keen for the dash of Caligula, I think, is a question that uh, I would prefer not to ask Herbie, <laughs> in case I got the truth. <laughs> well, now he's saying Herbie allowed us to go so far, but never in the top. I think John went the furthest of us. He went to the edge. Good night, great-grandmother. There was one scene that we had such difficulty with, because we laughed so much. You think I'm mad? We couldn't get through it. We couldn't get through it. We laughed and laughed and laughed. Herbie was going crazy, saying, oh, come on, pull yourself together. But we couldn't. We couldn't get it together. Oh, no, be honest with me. Has that thought ever crossed your mind? Never. Never. Well, the idea is preposterous. You set the standard of sanity for the whole world. Find yourself a place. Caligula's standard of sanity, however, included making his favourite horse a senator. Been to a wedding before. Show them the plunder we gathered from old Neptune. Having the Imperial Army collect seashells in his war against the god of the sea. And finally marrying his sister and decreeing them both deities. We gods drink it before we perform a miracle. Drink it, drink, drink. Uh, before cutting his unborn child from her womb and eating it. I mean, this was history. This wasn't us making it up. We tried very hard not to offend, but even so, you c you're always going to shock somebody. What are you going to do? There'll be no pain, I know it. Pain? But why should... The way I saw the scene is that I like to shoot scenes like this, which are really horrific, in letting the audience do the imagination. We don't actually see what he was seeing. We just get it from his face. Don't go in there. And the door finally opened completely, and we get one glimpse of the woman hanging there. Now, that was edited out the night before it went out, without my permission, consultation, or Martin Lismore's. You know, they thought we'd gone a bit far, but I think it was knife edge, you know. And I had the most king and queen of a row with the then controller uh, of serials. You know, yes, uh, but he had taken this decision on his own because he thought it would offend too much. I mean, let them be offended. The watchword butcher is liberty. If it was too much for the controller of serials, Caligula's reign was getting too much for the Senate and the Praetorian Guard, who decided enough was enough. The reluctant Claudius was promoted in his place. Well, he was the great survivor, the one everybody thought was an idiot. Uh, but he was cleverer than all of them because he lasted. They were all dropping like flies, killing each other. Then you see him as emperor saying, don't underestimate me. I think that scene was kind of the payoff for Claudius. As for being half-witted, well, what can I say? Except that I have survived to middle age with half my wits, while thousands have died with all of theirs intact. Evidently, quality of wits is more important than quantity. To everybody's surprise, 
Claudius kept his wits about him and enjoyed a glorious 13-year reign. We have re-established Britain as a province of Rome. 108 years after the divine Julius left it. But in true Roman tradition, he too was brought down by the treachery of a wife determined to see her son succeed. Is he dead? Yes. Yes, he's dead. Then I am emperor. Yes. <laughs> it's only after Claudius's death that his widow, Agrippinilla, and the new emperor, Nero, discover that Claudius has recorded the whole horrible history of his family. I have told it all. As I said I would, it is all here for remote posterity. Come, death, and draw the final curtain. I, Claudius, was a huge success. Derek Jacobi and Sean Phillips won BAFTAs for their performances and the legendary curse seemed to have been broken. But six weeks after transmission, tragedy struck when producer Martin Lismore was killed in a car crash. He was just 38 years old. Two years later, writer Jack Pullman died of a heart attack, age 51. And that was when Herbie rang me and said, it's either you or me next. Um, but thank God it didn't happen. But Claudius's shadow did loom large over some of the cast, whose subsequent careers also stuttered. A lack of offers forced Margaret Tyzak across the Atlantic, where she won a Tony Award for Lettuce and Lovage. George Baker didn't work for seven months after playing Tiberius, although he has since become famous as Inspector Wexford. Brian Blessed's career, however, simply went into orbit. Gordon's alive! Everybody wants me to shout these days, Gordon's alive. It's become a cult movie. Do it you, for you again, you love that again. Gordon's alive! Ah, oh, well, who wants to live forever? <laughs> Before going on to The Elephant Man and Alien, John Hurt teamed up with Sean again for Jack Pullman's Crime and Punishment. Herbert and Derek were reunited for Granada's medieval detective series, Cadfail. But whatever they go on to do, I, Claudius, remains a treasured memory. Me. Just a minute. Just wait your turn. It was a golden period, in a sense, and I'm quite absolutely certain it's one that none of us were ever, you know, would always be a major part of our lives. Uncle Claudius, I wasn't that the sire after all. Would you believe it? Could have knocked me over with a feather when they told me. In its own way, in its own time, in its own kind of capsule, perhaps it is um, a little perfect moment. It wasn't worth it, was it? I could have told you that. 